This is the Nichols Patrick Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of February the 2nd, 2015. Current Federal Tax Developments is brought to you by your State Society of CPAs and Nichols Patrick CP Incorporated. Any use of this audio without the express written consent of Nichols Patrick CP Incorporated and your State Society of CPAs is prohibited. Let's go ahead and take a look at what happened this week in the area of federal taxes. First, we're going to start out with a warning from the Treasury Inspector General's office. TIGTA, press release 2015-01, tells us that the TIGTA has noticed an uptick in the number and amount and expects to continue during the filing season of phone scams from individuals claiming to represent the IRS. These calls go out normally threatening people that they owe money to the IRS that must be paid immediately or some dire consequence will take place. That dire consequence may be the person will be arrested, they may be deported, they may lose their driver's license, they may lose their license to do business. After the person gets off the phone with the IRS, with the quote IRS person, they will often receive a follow-up call from whatever agency would be able to carry out the threat, stating that in fact they are there to carry it out. In fact, in some cases where it's law enforcement, they claim to be outside watching right now to make sure you go out and do the payment that the, IR, that the quote, IRS person wants you to make. They also add to this to, the, to basically to make it look good by having some background information they've obtained from the people from various sources, internet-based, etc. And also the caller ID that comes in says the first call is from Internal Revenue Service and the second call is, for instance, from the police department is from the motor vehicle department, is from, the, is from INS, basically whoever would need to execute the second item. When the person receives that call, they are told to, for instance, go buy a prepaid debit card and then pay their taxes with that card or make some sort of wire transfer. Now these operations take place offshore and they're robocall mechanisms, so they're just calling a whole area. In fact, I was at a recent conference where a number of CPAs were at and we were all laughing about the fact that we all have received these calls here. I'm in Phoenix, and we all found them on our answering machines that told us the IRS was calling looking for taxes from us. So these calls are going out widely. Your clients are receiving these. A couple of things to recognize. Well, those of us listening here probably know the IRS doesn't operate that way, and therefore this has to be a scam call. Many of your clients may be a lot more gullible in this area. They're not tax experts. They don't know how the service usually operates. In fact, they probably have had almost no interaction with the IRS aside from sending their tax return every, in every year. So now they hear that suddenly they owe this money and dire things are going to happen. So they'll take action. You should warn your clients about the existence of these scams. Also warn them about the fact that the caller ID is going to show that it comes from the IRS or from the other entity. Take to suggest taxpayers receiving such a call. If they actually owe tax or believe they might owe tax because the people get nervous, well, if I, he claims these bad things are going to happen to me if I turn this down, you call the IRS yourself. Hang up, call the IRS. The number one thing you should not do is stay on the line with these people because they're going to keep working the person until they get them to do something. So the TIGTA tells you immediately you should hang up and call back the IRS at 800-829-1040 and actually ask to speak with a person who will then look up the person's record and see if there's any balance due. The IRS happens to know that, so the person on that line can figure that out. If the person knows they actually owe no tax or told that they have nothing outstanding, TIGTA does request that you fill in an IRS impersonation scam form on TIGTA's website at www.treasury.gov slash TIGTA, T-I-G-T-A, or call TIGTA at 800-366-4484. Also, the FTC keeps track of scams like this, so they also suggest you file a report with the FTC and use IRS telephone scam as a comment when you put it on the website so that the FTC can basically isolate these and try to run these down. Your client should be told that generally the IRS does not make first contact via phone call. The IRS never asks for prepaid debit cards or Western Union wires to pay taxes. And certainly they don't have local police or the INS or the motor vehicle department sitting outside or sitting around going to take action if you don't pay your taxes. So you've got to warn your clients about these things because your clients are receiving these calls or if these calls have for some reason not hit your part of the country yet, expect them to be coming sometime soon.
Jake, there's certainly notes that normally these things pick up dramatically during tax season when people are thinking taxes is an easier way for the scammers to get people to go after it. And this is a set of scams that are currently running. Notice 2015-9, we take a look at relief for people who have received advanced payment of the premium tax credit. The IRS in those 2015-9 has provided that individuals who have to pay back, because remember, the, advan the advanced payment, when somebody went to the exchange last year, they told them their income, what they expected their income to be, what they expected their family size to be, et cetera. Based on that information, the exchange computed a tentative premium tax credit, and that premium tax credit for 2015 was then used to reduce the monthly premiums they paid. So basically, a subsidy was put in place. We go back and we now have to true up that subsidy. We have to basically determine, did they get too much or did they get too little? If they got too little, then they get additional credit on their return. That's not going to be a problem for your client. Where the problem's going to come is if they got too much and now they have to pay back some or all of that excess. What happens if the taxpayer didn't pay estimates to cover that, which they probably didn't, or they end up getting to the end of the year, they can pay the tax due, but they don't have the money to pay that repayment of advanced premium payment penalty, the advanced premium payment amount. Well, the IRS for 2014 returns is going to essentially waive the estimated tax penalty and late payment penalty for individuals who run into that problem to the extent of the, pre of the advanced payment that they have to repay. Now, there are better results if you file the return timely, so that they obviously want people to do that. And basically, it is only for 14. The IRS notes that relief already exists for individuals who owe the shared responsibility payment. Those are payments that are made by people that did not obtain insurance that had to have it. And those people, there are certain relief provisions there already in the law. So they added, but for 14 only, a special set of relief provisions for advanced payment amounts. So if you have a client or if you have somebody who runs into this and cannot pay the advanced payment amount, it's important to go back to this notice and ask for relief. The IRS does make clear that they are likely to get notices. They tell you how to fill in the 2220 to get out of this problem so you won't get the underpayment. Also, if you have late payment, they state that you're going to get that notice for late payment. This tells you how to respond for that notice for late payment to get rid of the late payment penalty that relates to the advance payment amounts that had to go on the return for 14. So if you run into that situation, remember notice 2015-9 has that information. Next, we're going to look at a question of when a building is placed in service. This is the case of Stein LLC versus the United States. This is 115 AFTR 2nd, uh, paragraph 2015-381. It is a district court case from Louisiana decided on January the 27th. In this case, a building had been finished up before December 31st. It was located in the go zone, and it was being built right at the end of the go zone rules that would allow the person building the building in the go zone, if it qualified, to claim half the cost as a current year deduction. But it had to be placed in service by the end of this December. The building had been completed. They had a limited certificate of occupancy so that they could go in and, you know, land, and basically they could start making pretend improvements to lease this building out. What they did not have, though, was the building open to the general public and available for it because it would appear the way this is written it appears this building was going to be used, for instance, for retail sales. And so there'd be retailers in the building. So we finished the building. Now we got to get the retailers in. They've got to put in their shelving and put in their equipment so that they can open their doors. None of the doors were open. The IRS said that building was not yet placed in service because no revenue was coming to Stein LLC yet from the building because it wasn't yet really rented and it wasn't really out there. Stein said, no, 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 it was in service because even though it may not, the building may not yet have been open, it was nevertheless available for its intended use, which was holding the shelving and the equipment and all the other stuff that would be used by the tenant. The district court agreed with the taxpayer that, in fact, it was in service. This gets to the quirks of the placed in service rule which gets results quite often in the cases that confuse both the IRS and taxpayers. The courts look, as this court did, analyzes whether the property was available for its intended use. It turns out that actual use doesn't necessarily equate to available for use. And in fact, there are cases where actual use 
has been held not to qualify where the property was not yet in the state that the taxpayer planned to have it in for using it in their business. And the flip side of that is there have been cases like this one where the actual use has not yet taken place. The building was not yet open to the public, but it was available for use. And so the was placed in service, the item was placed in service. If you have a client that looks at this, and this is always important for things that people put in right at year end, like this case, these cases always revolve around things that happen right at year end. You want to take a look at this case. This case references you back because the taxpayer and the IRS both cited back to other cases that can help you look at some of the ways the courts have basically sliced and diced to deal with this problem. But the key issue is, remember, is it available for its intended use? That's the key issue for placed in service. Next up, we'll take a look at unclaimed funds in the IRA. This is private letter only 2015-04021. In this case, we have the problem, as you may be aware, in most states, if you have unclaimed property, there's an unclaimed property statute in the state. So for instance, if you open a savings account at a local bank, and maybe it's a small account, it had $10 in it, you know, it's established when you were five years old, your parents established it, and everybody forgot about the account, after a certain period of time, if the bank cannot find you, the bank is required. And by the way, any holder, this can also be for things like accounts payable that you may have and you can't find the person to pay it to or refunds you may owe to customers that you can't find the customer. After a certain period of time, those funds under state law generally are required to be turned over to a state agency, which holds them for a time. And then after some additional period of time, basically drops them into the state general fund. Well, that appears to be what happened to this person. He had an IRA at an institution. The IRA custodian during 2014 transferred the funds in the IRA to a state agency without the beneficiary's knowledge. Under an unclaimed property statute, that'd be pretty normal because the beneficiaries, you know, we can't contact, we can't find our owner. If we can't find our owner, then obviously we transfer, we can't tell the owner we transferred funds. If we could tell the owner we transferred them, then we would need to go the unclaimed property route. So the owner was not aware of this. Now that's bad news because IRA funds, the state is not an IRA custodian and the funds are not being held in an IRA account. So that creates a problem for us because now the funds have been distributed from the IRA. When funds are no longer in an IRA account, they are deemed taxable to the IRA holder. The taxpayer discovered this issue when he visited his tax preparer. The ruling doesn't tell us why that triggered the discovery, just that it did. That may have been because the preparer went and needed to get some information about the IRA from the custodian, or possibly the preparer, as some people, some preparers are known to do, you know, introduced the client to the unclaimed property statute, introduced them to the fact there's a database out there, in many cases, for many states participate in the national database, that will tell you if there are unclaimed funds for a person, they may have asked to see if there were unclaimed funds for this person, and unfortunately, what they discovered was the unclaimed funds were from his IRA. That created a problem. Well, he filed a claim, got the funds back from the state, and then put them back in an IRA, but now he's got a problem. It's more than 60 days since the distribution. Because of that, he had to ask the IRS for relief. So they asked the IRS, we need relief from the 60-day statute. In this case, the IRS granted it. Important thing to note, you do have to ask for relief in this case. That means getting a private letter ruling and paying the fee for the private letter ruling, which of course is the downside of this whole thing. So while it's clearly fixable, and certainly I would expect the, IRA would, the IRS would generally grant relief in a case like this, the downside of it is most often is that clients are not gonna know. You know, clients are going to have the problem of why am I paying for this ruling? I'm certain, you know, but just ignoring it is not probably going to work because while the custodian probably didn't know where the beneficiary was, the custodian almost certainly issued a 1099-R, which eventually in the matching program would cause a problem. So interesting aside, if you have a client that runs into this problem where you suddenly discover an IRA has been in the state's unclaimed property fund, this tells us basically that we can get relief. The problem is we're going to have to apply for private letter ruling for that relief. Finally, let's take a look at private letter ruling 2015-05008. This is the case of an LLC that managed to terminate its S corporation status. As we should be aware, under the check the box regulations, 
LLCs are allowed to choose the type of entity they wish to be. By default, if they have one owner, they're a disregarded entity. By default, if they have more than one owner, they are treated as a partnership. That is, if they are a domestic entity. There are, we flip those default if it is a foreign entity and somebody is not responsible for repayment of debt solely by being a member. And that, that's a quirky side rule, not relevant in this case. The problem we run into in many cases is other advisors and sometimes even the tax advisors working with the client read LLC and start thinking that partnership rules are what you always use. And there's lots of reasons because most LLCs are taxes partnerships. We generally, you know, we have the partnerships we see these days, especially in states that don't have a special LLC tax, will almost by default be formed as LLCs. So we began to think there is a special set of tax rules that apply to LLCs distinct from whatever entity they might be. Unfortunately, that's not the case. The tax rules that apply to the LLC for income tax purposes depend wholly on the type of entity it checked the box to be. In this case, the entity checked the box to be a corporation and made an S election by filing a 2553. That's all well and good, but it has to maintain qualifications. To be an S corporation, there are two key problems they'd run into here. Number one, there can only be one class of stock. For S corporation purposes, class of stock is defined by what the rights you have to distributions, current and liquidating distributions. You have rights to current distributions and same rights in liquidation. All interest holders must have identical rights on a per interest basis in those two things. And the IRS ruled a couple of years ago that one of the, back in Revenue Ruling 9273, supported by the tax court in a split decision in the case of Tax Group Administrative Services versus Commissioner 133 TC number nine, that IRAs cannot be custodians, essential IRA custodians cannot be eligible S corporate shareholders. So if we issue a second class of stock or we have we have get a shareholder that is an IRA custodian, our S election is terminated and we become a C Corp. This entity apparently took on new equity holders. In doing so, it formed multiple new classes of interest, all of which had different rights in distribution and liquidation, as well it brought in some of the new money that came in came from IRAs that became interest holders of one class of the of the ownership interest. Well, the problem is, of course, your S election was terminated as of that date. You probably don't want to be a C Corp. It turns out the entity did not. Now you've got a problem. The entity, the IRS is allowed to rule that terminations such as these are inadvertent and they can grant retroactive relief, but to do so, the taxpayer has to first get back to the point where there's no longer a violation. That means you have to get rid of the multiple classes, and you also have to get rid of the non-qualified shareholders. In this case, that would seem to obviously mean that we have to get the funds, have to get the shares out of IRAs and into the shareholders' hands, and it also means that we need to make all interest holders have identical rights in distributions and in liquidation. As you might guess, there were reasons why we wanted to have different rights for people. That means we're going to have a little fun negotiating how to straighten this out. That's the first problem you got when you face this. And number two, that stuff coming out of an IRA, while this ruling doesn't deal with it, there's obviously going to be tax implications of funds going into an IRA, coming out when they came out and when they were taxable to the person, and various issues that can cause other income tax problems for these IRA beneficiaries. But in addition to all that, the IRS can impose certain conditions, which the IRS did in this case on granting relief. And what they required was for the IRA shares, in any year where the S corporation had a loss while it was held by IRA shares, those losses had to be allocated to the IRAs. So no pass-through of loss to the beneficiaries. However, any year in which the, I, which the S corporation showed income, the income, then the stock be treated as owned by the beneficiaries who would have to report the net income from the S-Corp, sort of the worst of both worlds. So the IRS granted relief, but there were strings attached. Key caveat in this case, if you have an LLC that's taxed as an S-Corporation, first, of course, you remember the rules are different, right? And we have to worry about this problem, but warn the client and make sure the client, if they consult an attorney, if they think about issuing new shares, if they're gonna go do things like that, make sure that counsel is made aware that this is an S corporation 
and make sure that any attempts to issue those shares or change the agreement or modify it or admit new owners, that they come back and ask you about the situation so that we can clear it from the tax standpoint in addition to the basic legal structure. Clearly, somebody didn't follow up in this case, and clearly that created a problem which required paying for and receiving a private letter ruling. The whole process there is not is one that takes a while and is not inexpensive. So this is not a problem you want to run into if you can avoid it. This has been Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of February the 2nd, 2015. Current Federal Tax Developments is brought to you by your State Society of CPAs and Nichols Patrick CPE. You can find information about all these cases at our website, currentfederaltaxdevelopments.com. We have more detailed write-ups about what went on in each of these situations, plus links back to the source documents. So if you want to go there, you can go ahead and pick this up. Hopefully you'll join us next week when we'll look at other further developments taking place in the area of taxes in the coming week.